Welcome all. I'm joined today. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Joe Casabian, the author of The Hooligans of Kandahar. He served in the US military, did several tours of Afghanistan and has now moved to Armenia. He even has a podcast of his own. He has been a major time proponent of the Armenian cause online. You may have seen his page also on Twitter. So... Joe Kasabian, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks for having me. So I want to first off start by this revelation that you've moved to Armenia. I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about uh, how the move has gone. Do you regret it? What do you like about it? Um, and also, it seems you do not want to return to the United States. Is that a permanent thing? Or like <laughs> maybe one day you'll return? Uh, well, I moved here for good back in July of 2022 now. Um, and it's been, it's been interesting. Um, unlike most people that move here, I think in most Armenian diasporans, although I did get my citizenship finally. So I guess I'm, okay. an, I'm a national, you're now. an Armenian citizen. Yeah. Nice. Uh, but unlike most diasporans, I was not raised in an Armenian household. I was not raised in the Armenian culture, the church. I, I still don't speak Armenian fluently. I'm learning now. Mm. Uh, I started learning last year when I moved here. Um, so I guess I'm a bit of an outlier in, in, in that kind of case. Um, but. Uh, before July, I came here the year before for the first time in my life, and I just kind of like fell in love with it. Obviously, things are a lot different then than they are now. Um, and it's like I've met great people. Uh, you know, people are very friendly. Uh, for someone from where I'm from in, in Michigan, it is the safest place I've ever lived in my life, right. even with the threats that we face um, on, a, on a daily basis, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of like a crime rate in the city, walking at yeah. night, yeah. It, it took about four months for me to get used to the fact that I could walk back to my apartment in the middle of the night <laughs> and I didn't have to keep my hand right. on my wallet on my cell phone, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but, you know, moving here was very interesting. I mean, it's very easy as an American citizen. I don't have to apply for a visa sure. or whatever. Uh, but, you know, since I moved here, I applied for my citizenship. And, you know, anybody who's ever dealt with immigration here knows it can be a, a pain. Obvious. Yeah, uh, especially after the war in Ukraine started mm -hmm. um, with all the influx of new people. It was finally approved. It, I mean, coming from the United States, I have a hard time saying that immigration here was hard. Right. Uh, where American immigration is psychotic and Armenia's is mostly just play the over game and wait. Right. Um, but, you know, other than that, it, it hasn't been hard to live here. I mean, it's challenging uh, coming from the United States, but in ways you don't kind of see coming. Mm. Obviously, things aren't as cheap as they used to be now mm -hmm. uh, with rent skyrocketing and landlords completely exploiting people to try to get money from Russians. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it, 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 it's the same as anywhere, really. Uh, new challenges of an immigrant anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I, I have a great group of friends that have helped me out a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's made everything, uh, it's made a world of difference since I've moved here. And as for going back to the U.S., I can't see a reason why. Okay. Uh, I truly can't. Did you like living in the U.S.? Or? No, it was terrible. <laughs> uh, I, I I enlisted in the military when I was 17. Yes. Uh, mostly to just get out of Michigan and specifically Detroit. But it, while I was in, I got to see the world for the first time uh, that I never would have been able, been able to see before. Hmm. Uh, mo like most Americans don't have passports. And I didn't. Like, I couldn't afford one. You know, it, it cost like, you know, $150 at the post office. And, you know, my family was mostly living out of our car at the time. So it's, it's not like we had the money like, oh, let's go to Germany. Let's go on vacation. Like th those things didn't exist to me. Um, and you know, most Americans, if they travel, they go to Canada or Mexico because it, you yes. can drive there and you know how Americans love cars. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, uh, at the time I didn't need a passport to go to Canada, which has changed, but you know, I went to Canada. This is my first overseas trip ever, which I guess not overseas, but over a border mm -hmm. until I joined the, joined the military and got to actually go see Europe. And obviously I get to go to other places that aren't great vacation spots, but yeah, it really did let me see a world outside of the United States for the first time in my life that most Americans simply don't get. Uh, and it let me see a lot of, well, let me understand um, a lot of the problems that America has, um, mm -hmm. especially, you know, I'm getting older. I'm almost, I'm almost 35. Mm -hmm. I would like to, you know, get married and have, have children one day. And I can't see a reality where like, I want my children to grow up in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly unsafe uh, anywhere you live. Um, you know, you're, there's mass shootings daily. Uh, the political situation is, even as we sit here in the South Caucasus, I feel comfortable saying unstable uh, in America. 
uh, and the future is incredibly uncertain. Things are so expensive, unobtainable. Um, and even though I'm, I'm much more comfortable in my life than I ever was growing up, I couldn't afford to put a child through college in the United States. It, it's right. that expensive. So, and, and even then, you know, you graduate and you go into the job market where there's nothing. You know, uh, so I, I I truly don't see a reason why I'd ever move back, mm -hmm. regardless of what happens here. Like, this is this is my country now legally. I can say, you know, yeah. I'm a citizen, and you know, I'm I'm here, regardless. It's interesting. A lot of the diasporans that come here that have children also, and they say how safe Armenia feels for children in a way that their home countries they don't feel the same way about that. So you came to Armenia the first time in 2021. Yes, 2021. Okay, and then. Had you decided then that you were going to move to Armenia? I mean, when did you make that decision to move to Armenia? My first trip was quite short because I had a, I had a normal job at the time. So I had to like get time off work. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was only like a week, a little over a week. So I didn't like I, I immediately fell in love with the place. Like I got to see uh, outside of Yerevan, which mm -hmm. uh, obviously a lot of people who come here don't really get to see for some reason. They don't go anywhere. Um, and I really, really liked it. And I immediately made plans to come back. And I went back the, uh, four months later yeah. uh, and I stayed for, I believe two and a half months Okay. in the middle of winter. Cause you know, everybody says, before you go somewhere, see the worst weather they have. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> you're coming from Michigan. I'm like, that Armenian winter isn't even that bad. Uh, but from then I definitely like, I'm coming back. Uh, I, you know, I had to go back to the United States and you know, cause moving and, and moving your entire life across the world can be a bit of a pain. Uh, but I had to go back and finalize a few things, but I was back by July uh, okay. after leaving, I, I believe the beginning of April. Okay. And you enlisted in the US Army at 17. Yes. You did multiple tours in Afghanistan. I want to just ask this question because I'm just fascinated to hear what your answer would be. In 2021, of course, US troops withdraw from Afghanistan and we saw the scenes, Taliban forces taking over Kabul, the rest of the country. Um, as a former like U.S. serviceman, what did you think when you saw those scenes, and what did you did you expect it? Were you surprised by it? What did you think when you saw all that? We all expected it. Yeah. Um. Uh, you know, I served my first tours in two thousand eight to two thousand nine. My okay. second tour it was uh ten to eleven. Right. Um. Sorry, eleven to twelve. Uh. Getting getting my years mixed up. And the one through line that pretty much goes through all of it, regardless of what your job was in the military is that anybody who worked because my, my job was almost specifically training afghan security forces and fighting with them namely the, the police and and for a lesser extent the army commandos but mostly the police and nobody who had that job nobody who had direct communication or contact with the afghan security apparatus or the government mm -hmm. ever believed it was going to hold together um and you know we were passing these things up through our chain of command like mm -hmm. we were supposed to putting in our reports every week and somehow at the end of that pipeline, it gets, you know, re-vomited by the, the Department of Defense that, you know, the military and police are ready. Like, who told you that? You know, yeah. no, nobody in the right mind believe that the Afghan security apparatus is going to hold together. And I don't mean that as an insult to Afghan soldiers or police officers. They were not the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Afghan police and army were fighting a war of attrition that was so brutal that most people aren't aware of how many people they're actually losing. They were losing tens of thousands of people a month, uh, killed and wounded fighting. Um, and you know, I fought in the, in the losing effort as well, but the thing that keeps you fighting is that, you know, you know, if I need bullets, I'm gonna get bullets. If I, if I need mm -hmm. food, I'm going to get food. If I'm wounded, a helicopter's going to come and get me, you know, they didn't have any of that right. ever for 20 plus years. So, you know, at the end, when they're given an option to like put their weapons on and go home, you know, obviously we, now we know that was a mostly a lie depending on where you fell in the security apparatus, but of course they're going to take it. Mm. Um, but as how I feel, like I always wanted the war to end. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was in middle school when it started and then I ended up fighting in it and I was in my thirties when it ended, which is uh, crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. But because the problem was, of course, um, you know, the U S was attacked on 9 11, but yeah. that did not facilitate or make the invasion and destruction of Afghanistan in any way ethical or moral. Uh, the United States and NATO partners and to let non NATO partners as well, um, exploited and annihilated a people who have been suffering through that since any of us have been alive. Mm -hmm. Um, and the Taliban are simply continuing that. You know, I was happy to see the war end in theory, 
But when the Taliban took over, the war isn't over. Right. Uh, it, you know, they're brutalizing people. Uh, women have absolutely zero rights. There's, they're facing an insurgency of their own mm -hmm. um, from multiple different fronts, from ISIS, from the kind of sort of reborn Northern Alliance. Mm -hmm. The war is over for America. The war is not over for Afghanistan. And I have a hard time seeing that it ever will be. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, is, is the carnage any less than it was when the United States is there? I have no idea. And I don't think anybody truly does either because we don't have any information coming out of there anymore. Mm -hmm. But as for, you know, watching the scenes of the planes taking off with people mm -hmm. dangling from them and the it, president fleeing on a plane. As yeah. Well. Which of course we all saw that coming. And now, uh, there's been a decent amount of leaks showing that he kind of knew that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, it's uh, it, it was everything that anybody who fought there saw coming 10 years ago. And the U.S. government was really hoping they could kick the can down the road to the next presidency, the next presidency. Maybe the next guy will figure sure. it out. Uh, because, I mean, Obama, when he got elected, was elected on this concept of ending the war. Yeah. He got elected while I was in the military. So it was it, it was just a continuous. I don't know how to end this. I can't be the guy who ends this. Mm -hmm. And obviously now it's going to fall on uh, President Biden, not unfairly, but also fairly, because, I mean, before this, he was also vice president. So he has. And then before that, he was in Congress. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it it's going to it was going to fall on someone. This was always going to happen. There was no situation where this ends where the Taliban are magically defeated or they end up in a coalition government and go into the grand jurga or something like that was never going to be reality. Mm -hmm. And we just tried our hardest from about like 2002 on to close our eyes and pretend that things would be different. Yeah. And it, it was inevitable, unfortunately. Yeah. And the Trump administration signed an agreement with the Taliban in yes. Doha, which what I'm also curious about is when you look at US foreign policy, do you see it as like a single entity or can you also divide it based on the two parties. Some people were very critical, for example, of the Trump administration's approach to to Karabakh, to Armenia, especially, for example, I don't know if you remember during the war, the whole ceasefire thing, his announcement, I made peace between the Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Yeah. Now there is talk that the Biden administration, the US is engaging in, in the South Caucasus, is being more proactive. Um, firstly, what do you think of that narrative? that the US is getting involved and is, uh, you know, uh, trying to mediate between the two sides. And also, what do you think of the narrative of, you know, Democrat versus Republican? Who's better for Armenia? Or is it all the same? I think fundamentally, it's both the same. Okay. Um, because uh, any kind of US engagement in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, obviously, their engagement in Georgia has been going on since, mm -hmm. since a little bit before the 2008 war. But I think we need to divorce the concept of American involvement in Armenia as being uh, in being involved in the South Caucasus as much as it is being involved in countering Russia. Okay. Because if it wasn't for the war in Ukraine, the U.S. still would not care. Okay. I, I think, in my opinion, we are just seeing a, you know part two of Cold War politics, but the the concept of a war against communism is stripped away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the the during the invasion in September, immediately afterwards, the U.S. is pretty heavily involved. Then, uh, you know, the speaker, the then speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, came, who's effectively the second most powerful person in the country. Mm -hmm. But all of this can be seen, I think, much more accurately through the lens of anti-Russia. Um, obviously, they invaded Ukraine, and ever since then, you see a lot of you know Russia's obviously and undebatably weakened by the war, mm -hmm. both militarily and politically. Uh, they're almost a global pariah. So the best way to continue to counter that is by pulling people away from their sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And we sit solidly within their sphere of influence. I don't think anybody would ever debate that. We're completely dependent on them for gas and someone argues security at this point. So it makes a lot of sense from an American point of view to pull Armenia away because especially after the, the invasion in September where Russia did literally nothing, it was a prime opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to see things like we saw in Georgia after 2008 where you see, you know, military liaisons showing up in crates and crates of weapons and reforms? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, not because we're still in, we're still in a, a, a legal ally of Russia. 
Uh, and as long as that exists, uh, the U.S. can only do so much. So the U.S.'s end goal could even be, would like to see at least the ousting of Russia from from Armenia. Oh, absolutely. It would be a huge win for them. I mean, despite the fact that Turkey's in NATO, I'm not saying that uh, we're ever going to be in NATO. Of course we're not. Mm. Turkey would literally always vo uh, veto that. It's never going to happen. But we could very much be... Uh, a security outpost. I mean, we already kind of are. The, the one, of the large. I think the largest U.S. embassy in the world is in Yerevan, mostly to you know monitor Russia and Iran. But it's still here. They know how important we are as to where we sit in the world, mm -hmm. right? And I think optimistically, we could see some kind of security assistance from kind of what Georgia has or has been receiving. But we have that hurdle of being a, C a CTSO or a CSTO. CSTO. Um, and that I think is a pretty major hurdle. However, when they see someone pulling away from Russia's orbit, it, now, you know, two years ago, they wouldn't have cared. They didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> but things have changed. The world is a much different place. And is that good for Armenia? I think it it's good and bad are kind of relative. I think it's the best option. Okay. You know, when you have one obvious, you know, you, you, you it's either we, we try to change our trajectory mm -hmm. or we continue being the same and being the same for the last 30 years has gotten us what, mm -hmm. I mean, even, even if we look at what happened in September and you'd completely take America out of the equation. What did being Russia's ally truly get us? We were invaded. They still occupy our territory and nothing was done. And then it came out that since the 2020 war, Russia hasn't been giving us weapons. Yeah. So it's like, what are we doing here? You know, the, 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 the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And that's effectively our foreign policy at the moment. Mm -hmm. And we do have to try to do something different. If we, if we want to do if we want to be better, if we want to change the way things have been trending and the way they've been going since before, since 2016, really, even before then, uh, because our military has effectively been stagnated since the mid nineties, mm -hmm. you can't keep doing the same thing. And it's, uh, it's nice seeing some kind of messaging that that is the case, but you know, words are one thing we have to make concrete steps to do something else. And, you know, this kind of geo geopolitics when we're the the buffer zone effectively between two superpowers right you do have to make some steps because continuing what we're doing is is obviously not working yeah and i think i don't think anybody who isn't being paid by someone or it doesn't have some weird conspiracy theory addled mind could possibly believe our future lies within the russian sphere of influence mm -hmm. i truly don't see how they could believe that Unless they just closed their eyes and ignored the last three years. Because there's this narrative of like, if Armenia moves towards the West, then that will antagonize Russia and then Russia will green light Azerbaijan to do what it will. And Armenia has to continue <laughs> taking its punishment beatings until kingdom come. I mean, right. Like uh, how, <laughs> what, where, where is the breaking point? Like any, and, and if you, if and someone can look at me dead in the eyes and say the last two wars were not green lighted by Russia. I have no idea what kind of drugs they're on because <laughs> it is absurd to believe that uh, Azerbaijan <coughs> could launch a full scale invasion of Artsakh and an invasion of Armenia without mm. Russia knowing when Russia is their main military supplier and ally. Mm. So you have to go into the situation already knowing that they've already greenlit the deaths of thousands of our soldiers and civilians. Mm. Like, I don't know how you can survive the last three years here and still believe that Russia could possibly be a savior. And as far as like antagonism, how much worse could it get? Well, I guess they would argue that it could get much worse. Sure. It could always get worse. But I mean, what is think of the the best case scenario is we pull away from Russia and maybe we get some help. You know, maybe we do get pulled more into the Western sphere of influence. Maybe we don't know. There's no as far as right. we are aware, there's no hidden agreement anywhere. But if we continue doing the same thing, mm. we're just going to continue the slow bleed of slowly losing everything. I mean, that is obvious. So that is a proven track record that we all remember quite vividly. The only thing that could be worse is somehow Russia greenlights a full scale invasion of the Republic, which militarily Azerbaijan isn't even able to do. Mm. So like 
I don't know what the worst case scenario here is. I mean, do you sit back and allow yourself to be slowly bled out or do you try to stop the bleeding? Because the option of staying with Russia is looking down to say your leg is blamed like this will probably be fine and then dying or trying to change something, putting a tourniquet on and trying to move forward with our life. Because, you know, as a country, we do need to try to move forward and be better at everything. Economy, security, all these things. Military and safety is a key part of this. And it folds into everything else to include economic development and international mm -hmm. investment, if you want to look at it that way. So the more that we allow ourselves to bleed out and, and, and constantly be victimized by our neighbor, it will just continue to feed into everything else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that goes into military forms and public attitude and government messaging. I mean, this isn't a one thing problem, but I don't see a downside of pulling away from Russia other than, oh no, our traditions of being a Russian vassal state will be ruined. How else could we possibly go through the airport and not be, and not be like annoyed by Russian intelligence when we're entering our own country? Mm. How could we possibly live without that? I have no idea. <laughs> so what do you think it is the people that are still like clinging on to that still believe that Russia is like fundamental for a security guarantee for for Armenia? What do you think their fault like processes? Why? Why? How did they come to that conclusion? That's a good question. I, I don't I mean, they're obviously divorced from reality, right? Like, how could you sit here for the last three years and be like, no, Russia will fix this? After everything we saw, after like Russian peacekeepers running from their outposts when our soldiers were being shelled, literally their job to protect our borders and they did nothing. Hmm. Um, and then the invasion of Ukraine changed the situation even further. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I fully understand like militarily, it probably didn't make a lot of sense for Russia to say, start bombing Azeri forces when they invaded us in September. However, they had a legitimate duty to do so by legal documents they signed with us decades ago nothing that alone should be enough to tell people that like oh wow russia is not a, a partner in good faith with mm -hmm. us and this alliance is useless two of the members are fighting each other half of the time and russia can't enforce their own thing it would be like what if nato existed with the u.s not doing anything it functionally doesn't exist mm -hmm. so we have an alliance that is not real holding us in place in a you know, a situation that's existed for decades that this alliance has functionally allowed to happen time and time again. So I don't see how someone could see that kind of thing, not to mention the conduct of Russian soldiers within Armenia mm. stationed in uh, Gumri and other places. I don't know how many times you have to see some drunken conscript go off and murder a family before you realize like, wow, maybe they shouldn't be here. Mm. Or how many times Armenian citizens are, you know, uh, annoyed at the airport entering their own country by Russian customs agents, or we don't even control our own borders and look what it's gotten us. Mm. I don't see what positive influence anybody could see in the Russians in Armenia. I mean, I don't mean this as like private citizens, like not, n not the people who have, have moved here, but like the government itself. I, I would really like to know other than some grass is always greener, uh, type thing of, of thinking how good things were during the Soviet Union, which they weren't. But like, I don't really know what they could be pointing at in our in our most recent history and be like, we long for this. Mm. Like, wh which part was it when they allowed us to destroy ourselves in the early 90s over a war, which they helped fuel on both sides? Or was it, you know, in 2016, when again, they fueled a war on both sides or 2020 when they fueled a war in Artsakh, which could have ended in a straight up genocide mm -hmm. or September when they allowed us to be invaded and have our like our soldiers be beheaded and executed in mass. Like which one of these things is this great Russian influence that we're supposed to be experiencing in this country? I truly don't know. Mm.
I'm, I'm like, if someone is listening and you believe this, please let me know. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell them they should contact you if they have any answers. I also want to talk about, it's interesting, obviously, you were a serviceman, you toured Afghanistan, the Armenian army. I'm quite confused. I'm not someone that's like an expert on military or like military tactics or anything, but you hear uh, so many different things in the sense of what's the problem right now for, for the Armenian military. Some will say it's morale. Some will say it's the equipment they use. Some will say... It's uh, structural, it's their chain of command, it's the problem of the old uh, guard in, in, in the military. Some say that's, that's not the case. Um, I'm confused. Um, at the same time, the Ar Armenian military's budget is being increased a lot at the moment. Um, we are hearing about buying weapons from new sources, from new countries. Um, what do you think about the future prospects of the Armenian military? What do you see as the problems? And do you think it's realistic to think that the Armenian military can be reformed and, you know, can be made into an entity that can stand up to Azerbaijan's armed forces, which is, you know, heavily funded, has the full backing of Turkey, is using Israeli technology? Mm -hmm. Well, I think everything you just named is a problem, um, to make a long okay. story short. <laughs> the problems with the Armenian Armed Forces are foundational and mm -hmm. structural and systemic. Of course, there's a problem with armaments, for instance, and not to mention priorities, right? Uh, like it came out, what was it this week? Oh, the military is going to go find new uniforms for all of its servicemen. Yeah. Our soldiers don't have helmets. Right. I thought they got new helmets. Some did, sure. <laughs> but I mean... That every time uh, you know, there's new MOD pictures coming out from the right. front line, there's, oh, look, there's someone wearing a Soviet metal helmet from before yeah, either of us yeah. were born. And Azerbaijan doesn't, they don't use any of those helmets. I maybe, there, maybe the reserves, right? Okay. Like, that, like that stuff is packed away in a warehouse for mobilization. Like a lot of countries have. Like the United mm. States has a lot of old stuff in warehouses if they okay. ever had to draft anybody. Not metal helmets, mind you, but older stuff. Okay. Um, it, the old guard is a massive problem. It's a top-down military ran by a, a bunch of people with way too many stars on their shoulders and no professionalism whatsoever. Um, I mean, I understand the need for conscription in times of emergency, mm -hmm. but I think what is what the Armenian military is is dying for is a professional military. Mm -hmm. That's a professional military ran by a professional corps of non-commissioned officers who can make on-the-spot decisions because officers allow them rather than the Soviet model where officers control everything and small unit leaders have absolutely no freedom whatsoever. That's how you see like the the paralysis of indecision on front lines. Nothing moves fluent, uh, fluidly like it should. Uh, I mean, Armaments are a problem. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. You probably should not have soldiers still going to the front line with using AK-47s or AK-74s. Mm. Uh, However, those guns work. You, they're, they're the territorial defense forces of Ukraine are making great uses of their very, very old Soviet weapons. They will work if they have to. However, there are so many other problems of, you know, soldiers not having socks, soldiers not having cold weather uniforms. We are in the South Caucasus. How is this a problem that we still have? Barracks, tents. Yes. Yeah. The fire that we that just happened. Mm. You know, it, it is it the thing that bothers me the most, especially as someone who 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 you might one day have a son who gets conscription conscripted into this military, is the country has given a very, very important duty to the military and that is the care and welfare of our sons and daughters mm -hmm. right uh and they are completely absent in this responsibility they live in unsafe barracks and this is just in peacetime mm. they live in unsafe barracks they are being heated by what is effectively a firebomb uh which means that there is no supervision no care and welfare for these soldiers from their non-commissioned officers or officers to allow them to burn diesel fuel inside for heat. You wouldn't be able to do that in the US military. <laughs> oh, God, no. I mean, as someone who was a non-commissioned officer, I would throw anybody who made that decision out of the military, yeah. uh, the best of my abilities, of course. But and then beyond that, training reform. Um, and. I understand that you know when you're looking at someone who gets modern reformation training from a NATO partner, it's a steep hill and it always will be a steep hill. But saying it can never be done is just not true. 
There is plenty of militaries who are not in NATO, who are not in the EU, have made systemic reforms. They take time, they take effort, they take money, but most importantly, they take willpower to do so. Because doing these reforms is going to piss off a lot of the guys who have made their entire livelihood stealing from the military and exploiting their soldiers, say, doing construction mm. or working in restaurants. You know, these things all have to be taken away. And it's not like, you know, the the, the saying there's a few bad apples or whatever, mm. but it's not a few. How how can how can we still have a, a staff that is manned by people who have just a series of losses under the record, exploitation of soldiers, corruption, but we keep them in place? Mm. And that forms a foundational institutional rot that will work its way downward. Anybody who talks to someone who served in the military could probably tell you of a crime that they saw encouraged by an officer. Really? Yes. They won't do it on air or publicly. You mean Armenian military or any yes. military? The Armenian military. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I recently did a story, well, it was about a year ago, for my show, uh, Lines Led by Donkeys, where I interviewed a lot of conscripts. And I asked them very basic questions like, were you hazed? Did people physically assault you? Were you encouraged to do crime? Everybody said yes. And it did not matter what unit they were in. It did not matter what their job was from truck driver to infantry to uh, some tech guy. Mm -hmm. They all experienced it. And that works its way down. You know, that is a foundational problem. And then it's expected for you to do the next thing to the next generation of conscripts. That doesn't build unit cohesion. That certainly doesn't build morale when you barely have a uniform on your back because a guy that's a year older from you stole it from you. You know, mm -hmm. you can't expect to fight a war. You want to see a, a, a really good representative representation of what that military looks like. Look at the Russian military in Ukraine right now. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the end product. And, you know, hopefully we never see anything that catastrophic or we really have to worry about that. I mean, we kind of did in 2020 uh, because you can expect the Artsakh Defense Armies run much the same way mm. because it's modeled on the Armenian military. Mm. Many, many of the soldiers are Armenian conscripts. Yeah. So you can expect this kind of foundational systemic rot that's worked its way down. And that doesn't just start at the platoon commander. This isn't some lieutenant that's forming this uh you know unit culture that has been passed down for generations from the top down right. and then it gets passed back from the bottom up because those people eventually get promoted I and mean, you spoke about a professional army i'm curious what you think are the motivations for a professional soldier as as opposed to a conscript soldier because that was a question going around armenians when they were talking about setting up a professional army over a conscript of course army. Um, I mean, the the motivations for a professional soldier can be multifaceted. It could be something mm. as simple as national pride. Okay. I mean, I mean, uh, the United States runs an all-volunteer military. We still have a draft registry. You mm -hmm. have to register for it. You never have to do any training, uh, nothing like that. You could be drafted, sure. Like the last draft the U.S. has is Vietnam. Right. Um, but, you know, it could be something as simple as national pride. It could be wanting to see the country, move mm. around, get out of your terrible hometown that everybody hates generally get away from your family uh, adventurism salary a professional like yeah. like career mm, you know because there's a lot of like for instance there's a lot of people in the united states military they're from the middle of nowhere dead end towns that used to be maybe man manufacturing hubs or farming towns but now it's just nothing but drugs and you know, unemployment mm. and this is like this is a way for you with you know, uh, as something as simple as a high school education to have a career mm. Um, and, you know, salary benefits every month. Maybe it's not the best, but it's enough to provide for you and your family. Well, then that's fully possible in Armenia because there are some communities where young people feel they don't have opportunities of course. and they'd like to get out. And yeah. Do, yeah. And I mean, you would always rather go to war with an army that wants to be there than the people you, you drug kicking and screaming out of their homes. You know, who put off their education. Maybe they're the sole breadwinner in their household. 18 year old. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, there's always a time and a place for an emergency draft. Unfortunately, mm. those things probably should exist. Just like a uniformed reserve or, a, you know, in the, in the U.S. we have reserve and a national guard because we have such a huge country where every state has its own national guard. But um, there is a place for those. There is a place for reserves where maybe, you know, you want to go play army, but you don't want to do it more than one weekend a month fine but you know the time comes you'll you might be called up we need you and that's that that's something that that person is going to have to accept but those professional militaries will always fight better than conscripts mm. because they want to be there 
Yeah. And not to mention, you know, you can spend, you have to spend more money. These, these people are a, a human investment in your country. Mm -hmm. You can't treat them badly. They won't re-enlist. Mm -hmm. Don't tell other people don't enlist. It sucks. You know, you have to treat them better. And because you're treating them better, they become an investment. You want to spend more money in their professional education, their military education, their health. All of these things are become very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. It becomes a self-sufficient ecosystem that you need for national defense. Lions led by donkeys. That's the title of your of your podcast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm wondering in the United States, uh, in the US military, did you ever have that sort of experience or is it very much correctly structured? And uh, did you feel like it was where it should have been where the higher ups, you know, behaving professionally, appropriately? I can't speak for any other branch of the military because I was only ever in the army. Right. However, I will say for all of its flaws, of which it's a military, it's the government. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's innumerable amounts of flaws. It works. That's a meritocracy. You're not going to see someone pay their way to get promoted. Okay. Um, I mean, I made it quite high in the NCO ladder and I had a high school education because okay. I was good at my job. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, of course, people fall through the cracks. There's problems. It's a massive organization. So there are, you know, it, that was, that's been at war for decades. So it comes with its, its fair share of problems, but you never, uh, not at least to my experience, I should okay. say, did I ever see someone get abused by leadership physically? You get yelled at, sure, it's the military, whatever. For sure. But if someone, like, if, if I would have put my hands on one of my soldiers, I'm going to prison. Right. It's not like a slap on the wrist, like, oh, no, it's Sergeant Kasabian's always always been that way. No. Mm. Or if I steal my soldier's paycheck, I'm going to prison. Mm. My, all my benefits are gone, and then I'm a civilian. Like, wow. th that is not tolerated. Did you see that ever happen to someone who got, like, punished for yeah. behaving incorrectly? Yeah. Um, I, there was a, I use an NCO in a platoon of mine who got really, really mad at one of his soldiers and hit them. They were gone in a month. Wow. And that's that guy had been in the military for over 10 years. He had a pension only a couple of years in the future, gone as fast as the, as fast as they go. And not to mention he, he did like six months in prison before he was drummed out. Mm -hmm. Those things are just not tolerated. And of course, this is my personal experience. Of, of course, abuse happens. Abuse happens in every organization. There's many problems within the United States military, just like there's problems in any large organization. But systemically, no. Um, those things are handled because we understand how it attributes to morale rot. For sure. How can a platoon work together if you know that you're more afraid of your own leadership than the enemy? Yeah. Like, this was a big problem in the Armenian military. Even they said during the 2020 war, a lot of blame was pinned on officers, for example, abandoning their, abandoning their posts mm -hmm. and stuff, treating conscript, conscript soldiers incorrectly. Uh, your book is titled The Hooligans of Kandahar. Yes. Kandahar is a Taliban, well, now. Birthplace, and yeah. Worse, birthplace yeah. where their shura, their like council was located. Why hooligans? Who are the hooligans? Uh, that was my squad. Um, oh, okay. It ended up being a nickname um, because we had something of a reputation for being quite aggressive, not okay. like, like the normal population, of course, we were you know, disciplined when, uh, as we should be, but we didn't have a lot of indecision, any of these things. Like mm -hmm. if, we, if we saw a problem, we, we handled it. Like we didn't like call up and like, oh, should we do this? Should we do that? Like, no, there, that's, we need to raid that building because we have information there. there. And, you know, we were much rougher uh, than you know, maybe we should have been. Um, but uh, one time there's a guy in the tactical operations command uh, or talk, which runs most of the missions and you go out of bases. And he said, uh, y'all MFers are hooligans. Uh, <laughs> so but, he, that. but he made it, yeah. a, he, he meant it as a compliment For because sure. they knew it like every group of soldiers, especially in that kind of war is, are, are good at a certain kind of thing. Oh, okay. Not everybody can be a, a jack of all trades, master of nothing. That, that just means you have a whole bunch of bad soldiers. Generally, you know, there was a squad of people who were much better going out to the reconstructive sites, mm. you know, dealing with local village leaders and then like okay we need someone to go in and break something we're going to call this squad and that was us mm. <laughs> nice okay well the book is titled the hooligans of kandahar and it's available on as amazon uh, it's it's available in the united states of course it's available most places you can buy books uh but it's available on amazon uh online nice. resellers wherever yeah
Okay, perfect. Well, Joe Kasabian, thank you very much for your time. You should come down again sometime. Absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> I, I live five minutes away whenever you want me. <laughs> so it was easy to get to. Today. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, of course. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you very Anytime. much, Joe. And thank you for joining us on Civil Net.